urban centers alongside the airports and seaports. The reforms we have put in place in the power sector would guarantee increased efficiency in our drive to significantly expand the generation and distribution of electricity for use in homes and factories. With the recent opening of our borders, we expect that the pent-up demand of legitimate cross-border and international trade will boost the fortunes of the many small businesses and agricultural enterprises that depend on Nigeria trade and commerce. The message to our West African neighbors is that Nigeria is once again fully open for those willing to conduct business in a fair and equitable way. Well, those were excerpts from the president's uh, New Year Day speech, especially with regards to the economy. But part of what we had been having earlier, even though we were talking about education and the return of children to school, also borders on the economy. Uh, to discuss that with us this morning is Professor Magnus Packol, who is Executive Chairman, Economic Growth and Development Center. Uh, you're welcome to the program, uh, uh, Prof. Thank you very much. Well, you have followed conversation from last year into this year. Last year, it was a very delicate uh, balancing act between uh, saving lives and protecting livelihoods. Uh, inevitably, a lot of people lost their jobs. Uh, inevitably, the economy went into a recession. Uh, we saw that also you know, in different parts of the world. The question now is, so some people say we're even into something deeper than a recession. We're into a stagflation, so to speak, because inflation figures are also hitting the roof, the highest we've seen in the last three years. Uh, what exactly are, are, not the potential now, but what exactly are the ways, the paths that you're seeing out of the quagmire which we found ourselves? Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. I'm very happy to, uh, to be with you guys this morning. Um, well, the, the problem is that if anybody knew the solutions um, exactly as we need them, we would not be in the situation, in the quagmire that we're in now. So, but what it is, but there are some ideas, you know, that we can, we can start to look at. Well, first of all, let's go back a little bit. The problem we have actually um, goes back many years. Um, it's a result of the economic complication that Nigeria found itself in because of the politics involved with the what I'll call economic geography of the country. And I explain that. When we got oil, then we pivoted. In fact, we did not pivot. We shifted uh, completely from the ground nuts, you know, from the cocoa and all the other things you know, that, that we were working on, where our people were very meaningfully deployed in terms of their labor. And then we went to a very capital intensive kind of industry in crude oil production and some refining. And, and we did not carry our people along. Maybe as a result, we also did not put a lot of emphasis into, the, uh, into investments in the human capital. In, in, our, in our people as assets, as the most important assets that we have. So, so, so to come to jump to now and act as though the problem just started last year it, it is really not exactly the way to look at it. But that being the case, since we got COVID, since we got the livelihood problems and the, and the lives problems last year, and they are still with us, so what, 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 what do we see? What we saw, what we've seen over the last few months is that we had some industries or we have some, some industries that have done reasonably okay, like ICT, um, representing very large, probably 17, 18% of GDP. Of course, because a lot of people sat at home during the lockdowns and they were making phone calls and they were using telecommunications and things like that. And they were using Zoom. 
and all kinds of stuff like that. And then we also had increases in a very interesting area like chemicals and pharmaceuticals because people were making hand sanitizers and people buy hand sanitizers and, and cleansing agents and things like that. So we see, and then we also saw very good improvements in fintech. The fintech sector, or part of, of, of finance, uh, began to do well um, as people just did a lot of things online. And in fact, the, I, I think that the data that suggests that the guys that are in that industry um, are raking in upwards of $300 million um, a year. So, so we, well, there are some improvements that we saw in certain sectors, but the, the bulk of the economy suffered, shown in the third quarter significant decline, uh, and of course even second quarter decline. So you got two consecutive quarters. Uh, but the problem I, I keep telling people is that let's not just look at the GDP headline numbers. Let's look at what's happening to the individual. Where are the jobs? Basically, where is the beef? The people don't have the beef. People don't have jobs. And the reason is because uh, we have taken our eyes off the ball in terms of production. Nigeria has just not been producing goods and services and using people to do so. We've relied exclusively on oil production. Indeed. So we have to change. Uh, yeah, I indeed. I mean, you have chronicled yeah. where the rain began to bit us economically as a country. Yeah. Um, however, uh, however, we've since realized that. Yeah. Uh, and we've been talking about diversification for yeah. years now. Um, <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes we'll see um, a silver lining. We'll see, uh, I don't want to say a flash in a pan, but that's how it looks sometimes yeah. uh, when we see that, you know, some of the sector, apart from the oil sector, yeah. uh, you know, has provided the bulk of what we see in the GDP, especially when they're doing, when they're doing good. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's not so significant, but we can see it growing incrementally. Yeah. Um, we, we've also seen that even in I mean, the breakdown that you provided over the last one year yeah. that it's not been all negative yeah. um you know in, in terms of what has happened to the economy we've seen certain areas of the economy improve however the question is how there are challenges with manpower because yeah. this seems to be a very specialized sector of the economy talking about ict talking about fintech for yeah. instance uh however the consumer goods which will be which could mean factories how sustainable is that if a government were to say for instance uh, we want to go into we want to encourage the consumer sector the the, the yeah the consumer product sector and also agriculture, which might yeah. not need too much specialization uh, yeah. to go into. What are your thoughts with regards yeah. to those areas that could easily create even more jobs? Yeah. And how sustainable do you think it will be on the long run? Yeah, I mean, that's the point. That's why I talked about the complication in the economy. Now, in agriculture, I cannot remember any time recently where in any quarter we grew anywhere near 5%. Um, in, in agriculture. And, and that's, the, that's the sector that hires the bulk of our people. So if you're not even growing near, in fact, I can't remember when we've grown significantly over 3%. So if you have a population that is growing at 3% and your agricultural output is not even growing near that, then that, that signifies a problem. And that problem to me is a problem, well, a number of reasons. The one reason is security. A lot of our farmers, as we all know, are not out there farming, they're scared going to their farms. They have security issues. But, but one big reason also is that people are pivoted from that activity to something else because they, they see the lights in the urban centers and, they've, and they're going there to try to partake of this thing that's coming from crude oil. So the young guys coming out of our universities are not trying to go there, go to, to, to the farms, or go to rural areas with their parents to do farming. And so what we need to do is to find a way um, to invest in people so that they can go and do a bit of uh, mechanized type farming, a bit of a more up-to-date type of farming so we can compete with, with the farmers in other countries. In other countries, you have a very small proportion of the population in farming, but they are churning out huge amounts of, of farm products and selling some to us because it's much cheaper to buy from them than to buy from our own people. 
So, so I think that we have to look at farming very critically. That means we uh, to look at it, it means you need to look at the guys who are producing the farm produce, their security and their ability to be globally competitive. I don't think that we have that ability right now. And, and nobody would argue because we look at the evidence. The evidence shows that we are not competitive. If you can even grow agricultural output over 3%, we want that to be 7%, 8%. If you can't do that, it suggests that there is a problem. And what is the problem? The problem is with the tools and the, and the human resources that are involved. Mm -hmm. So I think our ministries across board have to look at that. And this is another area where we're not, we're not very um, focused. We're not as focused as I would like us to be. I think that there is a sort of, um, uh, that we don't have the synergy that we should have, um, there's a dislocation of activities that, you know, between the states, the local, and the federal. Um, so so we, we, there's not much complementarity. So the federal government should be a little bit more catalytic in pushing state governments to do more, and the state government should free local governments to do a bit more. Uh, I see some states are doing much better than others. Uh, in terms of the freedom that they give uh, to local governments to be able to be on their own and cause their people to go out and work. So if we're looking for a way out, <laughs> the country is made up of the 774 local governments that we have. So, so what happens in those local governments is what happens in Nigeria. So Nigeria as a whole is an aggregation of these local governments. So what I would like to see is a situation, and I've said this before, where we begin to look at setting up corporations in each local government. So a local government has a local government development corporation. It's a company. And that company looks to how to produce from that local government. And that company looks to how to export mm. from that local government. But that is, that is catalytically driven from the center, from Abuja. So, so we set the tone and we say, this is, we're gonna open up space. And we're going to go out there and try to look for markets for you, for whatever you produce from with, in West in Africa, West Africa and Africa. We talk about the African president just talked about the Africa continental free trade area. Well, if you open up borders and you don't have things to sell, then what good is it? Then you just become a dumping ground because in the Africa continental free trade area, every single country is looking at Nigeria as the market to go to. So that's, that's where they're coming. That means our folks have to be extremely globally competitive. And you're becoming even more hostile to, you know, accepting our people in their own countries. Look at what's yeah. happening in Ghana, for yes, instance. Absolutely. To even say, okay, maybe the production, the factors of production are a little, you know, cheaper or, you know, easier in Ghana. Let's go to Ghana and produce. Mm. It's a problem, yeah. you know. Uh, I'm wondering, though, it would seem that for every solution that you find, Nigeria has a unique perspective to the problem <laughs> let me give you an instance you yeah. talked about security yeah. uh you know being a challenge which is which is a fact you talked about 774,000 uh jobs or 700, 774 local governments. Yes. We know that not all 774 local governments are functioning as local governments. Uh, there are local governments that have been overrun by bandits. Yeah. There are local governments that have been run overrun by Boko Haram. There are local governments that are only existent in name because the people only go there to you know share whatever location is given at the end of the month and that's that yeah. you know so sometimes and then there are the local governments i mean there are some states for instance towards the end of last year the rains last year yeah. uh, wreaked havoc on their agricultural produce and i don't know how the farmers from those areas have recovered so far yeah. uh, how do you then go back to say hey look you know, this is what we're thinking now. We will still encourage you to go into agriculture. Do you think that we've sent that signal strongly enough uh, for people to have confidence uh, to say that whatever happens, my effort will not go to waste. I will definitely reap something yeah. at the end of the day. Absolutely. Well, well, the thing is this. Obviously, not every local government is adversely impacted, you know, by, by insecurity. Uh, so we have some others that are not, but, but a good number of them, especially in the northern part of the country, have serious insecurity problems with bandits, Boko Haram and all of that. 
And I think that for those people, and this is where I, I'm very um, proud of the efforts of some of the governors of the, of the northern part of the country, that the, 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 the current governors are doing, in my estimation, much better than the governors of before. I mean, look at Kaduna, Sokutu, Bochi, um, uh, even Katsina, you know, in terms of their pushing uh, literacy uh, measures. The, you, you have to be able to read and write in a global language of commerce uh, to, be, to be able to be globally competitive. So when you have states where the literacy rate is like 30-something percent, 40-something percent, you cannot be globally competitive that way. We just have to say it exactly as it is. You compare with Lagos, where the literacy rate is in the 90s, even by us at Rivers, very high literacy rates. So if you want to have activity, even if you're displaced by Boko Haram, then you can move to Lagos, then you can go to Port Harcourt, then you can go to Abuja and get into fintech activities and get into computer software activities. You get into graphics production. But if you're not, if you're not, if you don't have good literacy, that's going to be difficult. Then you are stuck. Your choices are limited. So, so that's the point I keep making that we have to look at the, 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 our most important asset is the human asset. And I, that's when I talked about economic geography, I was saying, well, we look at the crops that we produce across the country. Then we look at the politics that will influence the allocation of the revenues from, the, from our natural resources. And then we get quagmired at the National Assembly and in the presidency on how to handle that. But what we should be looking at is the human being. How do we train the human being so that a guy from Sokoto can easily go to Lagos or to Port Harcourt or to Onisha or to Kaduna and perform just as well as anybody else? Mm. Now, and, and they can even, and then we also have to look at partnerships among states. And you know, so one state, and I keep saying this, Katsina State brings the cow, River State does meat packing. Okay, so they're working together, kind of like the relationship we have now between Kebi and Lagos. So it shows these kinds of things can happen. We need to develop. So we, we can't just be looking at the, every time we gather, we recite the GDP numbers, we recite inflation numbers, we talk about stagflation. But that's, the problem is you got to get to the root of it. The root of it is with the peasants. That's what the problem is. If you look at the countries that are successful, that's what they've done. If you look at the economic freedom, the, 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 there's this ranking of this economic freedom index. We are, I believe, uh, number 116. That's not that bad. We're about number eight, number nine in Africa. Not that bad, but we could be number 50-something. We could be close to where Mauritius is, is or, or Botswana. Um, the, the, I mention that because I think that the, the federal government, especially, has to open up more space. Even in the petroleum industry, we need to have more activity as our people get more um, computer literate, as they get more inclined to ICT uh, and, and, and can handle some of these capital intensive activities. We need to create space for them so that they can do it. But I think that the government crowds, uh, crowds out the, the working population in many ways. We have a government that is fat and, and, that, and that fatness affects the, the, our, our being able to be nimble, you know, our agility. So our economic agility is hampered by our weight. So we gotta be able to do something about the government wise. The government is not as nimble as the private sector. We have to understand that. So if we are going, so you know, the whole thing boils down to production, however you look at it. If you look at the exchange rate, uh, you talk about stagflation. Stagflation is worsened by the exchange rate because first of all, you don't have a job, they have high prices. It really hurts you. We have food prices now near 20%. The, the latest report, the headline number is about 15.8%. To be precise, 15.75. I don't like to be that precise. But so we a little over 15% uh, month, year over year in December. Uh, that's headline number. But the, but the food inflation is near 20%. You, you can't keep doing that and then people succeed. Then, that, so to buy stuff from here is expensive. To buy it from overseas is even very expensive because of the exchange rate. Most people are dealing at the parallel market. Even if you went to the so-called official rates near 400 compared to how it used to be. Have incomes risen that fast to meet up with that kind of drastic change, that phenomenal change we've seen in the exchange rate? 
and mm. also in inflation. So these are the things that are causing the misery that people are facing. The question is then, how do you get out of it? How you get out of it? And we have to say, and I keep talking about it, but that's what my company does, is to look at the human capital development the, the, the issue that we face. We've got to be able to invest in our people and start early. And don't worry about it. Let me do it during my four-year term. You just start it. Mm. And, and, and you know, over eight years, 10 years, 20 years, we will see a dramatic uh, difference. Mm. Let's go to Lagos now. Okay. Ayo has a question for you. Yes, uh, Mokwe, thank you. Prof, talking about the human capital development, as you just mentioned now, uh, won't, I find it interesting, especially because, as you well know, Nigeria as a developing country would have something in the region of 70 to 80 percent of its uh, you know, economy relying on the small and medium enterprises. Talking about capacity, looking at the figures that we have now, we clearly have a deficit of capacity. To grow the economy, we have to grow that sector. What do we need to do? Uh, yes, I well, well, that's the, that's the point. I mean, you 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 answered the question in a way because you think you focus on on human capital development. I, I think that that's 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 what it is. We need to look at the human beings when we talk about economic growth. In reality, I know that people are looking at the change in output, but in reality, we're looking at the change in the factors of production. So you say, okay, what are the things, what are the factors that are producing these goods and services that we talk about? And I'm saying that the most important factor is, is human capital in the labor and in the entrepreneurship and, and the other things that are involved. The, so the question, so prof, it, that the is question, the management the, of, of... Pardon me, of Prof. The, the question then is, so I what is the shortfall, my, my apologies, what is the shortfall in that sector? What, what is it that they need for us to be able to grow? What, what, what are the deficits? What are the gaps that we need to fill for, the, for us to be able to grow that sector? Well, good. Well, the, the, what, we, okay, what we can do right away is what I call um, tax-specific human capital development. So we go to, you don't have to wait to send somebody to school and let them take 20-something years to get a PhD. But you can go to a task and say, what do I need to, to produce this particular good? Maybe it's three months, maybe it's six months, and we give the training for that. And that's the reason I said that we got to go to the local government. The federal government cannot do it all. I'm telling you, they, they cannot do it. They want to pretend they can do it, but they cannot do it. And they, and they make matters worse for themselves in pretending that they can do it. The federal government should be just more catalytic. Cause the states to do it and let the states free the local government. That's why we have the local government chairman. That's why we have them. Let the local government chairman get together with the people in their community and say, what skills do we need in order to be able to do, uh, handle outsourcing opportunities for the United States or the UK? Then that local government will be able to do it. We've got people, Nigerians in the diaspora, some now occupying even very significant positions, as we can see, even in the incoming uh, Biden administration. But we have other Nigerians in the diaspora that we can partner with. The, the, the idea of partnership is also crucial. The criticality of it cannot be overemphasized. So I think that we to partner with people if we're looking for uh, short fixes and, and bridging that gap that you talk about, well, that gap would be bridged when we have people given the skills so that they can mobilize the resources, like I said, tax-specific human capital development. Yes, it's good to go to school. It's good to go study coding, which is extremely important at the early stages, primary school, secondary school. All our kids ought to be studying coding so that they can compete with the Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Americans and all of that. But you also have people that can be given, there used to be something called adult education, but we can also do adult education uh, with computer skills. It can be done. Uh, you're telling them this is how you produce this, and if you want to, you can get partners from outside. And now there are many Nigerians that are well qualified that are outside that can come and partner with you. Mm. And so, so I, I think we can do that. Well, Prof, I do hope that there are people, who, policymakers and you know, people who mean well for the country who are racking their head day and night to see how we can get out of where we are now economically speak, 
listening to you and I hope that uh, the takeaways that they have been able to you know take out will be solid I mean definitely journalists like me, myself have more questions to ask of policy makers who should be thinking in this direction we have to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us this morning uh, Professor Magno Pakol is executive chairman economic growth and development center as a former chief economic advisor to the president and ceo of national planning commission and also a former professor of economics at the university of dallas in the united states thank you so much for coming on sunrise Daily this morning